Welcome to the Debit This, Credit That podcast with Wheeler Accountants located in San Jose, California. In this podcast, we discuss how to solve accounting challenges in both your personal life and your business. We take an energetic, tech-savvy approach to solving accounting challenges that steal your focus and your time. Now, on to the show with your tech-savvy accounting experts, Matt Wheeler and Michael Bryant. Today, we're going to be talking about choice of entity, and there's a lot of stuff that Matt's going to dive into and drive and, and really drop a lot of thought leadership on us, everybody. So uh, let's just jump right in. So Matt, tell us what choice of entity is and really what the big problem or one of the big questions you answer by helping people choose which entity they should be. Well, when you when you say there's a you know a lot of information we're going to cover, that's, that's exactly it, I think. There's just so much to think about when you're deciding what kind of entity to do. And, you know, when people usually come to me for this, they have like a laundry list of questions and sometimes they're putting the cart before the horse. But I think the the problem is really just identifying the appropriate form of entity you need for your new business venture um, or even an existing one if you're thinking about just changing the structure. But, you know, trying to find the right form for you that takes into consideration all the tax legal and practical considerations you need to think about. Well, what questions do you need to ask yourself? Because I just went through this with my accountant and we did make some changes because he asked me a number of questions. So let, let's dive into those. Uh, and everybody, please get a pad of paper out because these are really good questions, not only to just ask yourself when it comes to entity, but really what you want your business to become. There, there are a lot of questions to ask yourself. Um, you, first, I usually you know, ask people, do you even need a legal entity? So if you're just getting started, the first question I ask is, do we really need one? Uh, you know, what level of activity you're going to have currently or uh, you have currently or going to have for the next six months to a year or a couple years? Are you going to own the entity yourself? Are you going to have multiple owners or partners? Uh, what type of business are you running? Uh, are you going to have, you know, net income off the bat or there's going to be a startup kind of ramp up phase where you're going to have initial losses? Are there any legal considerations you need to consider where it's going to really force your hand one way or the other? What is your, you know, what does your personal tax situation look like? That kind of goes in tandem with the, you know, are you going to have losses in the beginning? And we can touch on that more later. Uh, you know, are you going to have employees? Um, what kind of vendors are you going to use? All these kind of things are questions you want to be asking yourself. And I think as we go through the different types of, of ownership or types of entities for sole owners, which we're going to cover today, we, we'll, we'll answer some of these questions. All right, Matt. So now we should probably jump right into what the four types of ownership are, right? So this is sole ownership. Is that correct? Yeah. Today, we're just going to talk about sole ownership. So you own 100% of the company. All right, fantastic. So let's let's dive right in. And uh, now you asked the question, do you even need an, an entity? Uh, so how do we start with that? Um, well, you know, so when you have a, a business, you're you're starting up or you got one going, a common ones like, uh, you know, your consultant or something, you get paid via 1099 income, you're not an employee, or you have some other, you know, small venture you're starting. If you don't have any sort of legal entity established, you're considered a sole proprietorship. So that's the first category. Uh, there, there are three more. You could do an LLC, where you're you own 100 percent, or you could form a corporation. And there's two types of that: there's a regular corporation, and then there's a subchapter S corporation. So um, we'll probably talk about sole proprietorship first. Okay. Um, and. You know, that's the one where when, when someone comes to me a lot of times and they ask, you know, what kind of entity should I form for my business? The first thing I, you know, come back with is, do you need an entity? You know, are you are you putting the cart before the horse? Right. Sometimes people just think they need the entity or that having an entity has some tax magic that happens where all of a sudden you get more deductions or, you know, you have like unlimited are limited liability where you you know you're totally protected or those kind of things and those those do happen but sometimes people get way too far ahead of the game uh, <clears throat> you know I, I think a lot of the time I see people that are too focused on getting an entity established and not really focused on the business part of it and making sure they're actually have a business they're going to be doing and making money and that kind of thing because once you go down the entity route 
you have additional costs for mm-hmm. compliance, annual costs. Uh, there's minimum taxes here in California for the privilege of doing business in our lovely state, um, <clears throat> things like that. So, you know, number one, I always ask, do you even need an entity? Well, what happens if the answer is no, right? So, so if I don't need an entity, then, but I still need you though, right? Because you're still going to make sure that I'm still keeping everything above board. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't need an entity, so let's just say you're a, a consultant and you're making some, you know, income or, or decent income or something, and you got some business expenses and that kind of thing. If you if you don't have like a, a reason to need an entity, I say don't do one. If you want to have a different business name that's not just your personal name, then you can go get a, a DBA, a, a doing business as fictitious name, you know, with your city or whatever, and that'll cost you a couple bucks. Um, if you don't want to be giving people out your social security number when they ask for it for 1099 reporting, you can get an employer ID number or a tax ID number for your business without setting up an entity with the IRS. Um, and if you're concerned about liability, a lot of times just a liability insurance policy, you know, or a business insurance policy will cover you for a lot of that and actually more than what you would have by setting up an entity. Hmm. Do you usually recommend that, that people have that from a supplemental standpoint, depending? Yeah. I mean, generally, I think you're going to want to look at your insurance coverage and make sure you're covered. Um, some of the entities you set up will give you liability protection if you get sued or something, but mm-hmm. they're still not going to pay you or they're not going to pay for your attorney's fees, for mm-hmm. example, which is a huge thing where your insurance, you know, ideally should cover some of that. So even if you have that liability protection from an LLC or something, if someone sues you, you're still going to be paying out of pocket for all the attorney's fees. So, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's you know, so having an entity doesn't really, isn't the complete answer sure. to just stop in liability, right? So after meeting with you, you do decide that you need, I need an entity. So I'm going to be your client here. So, so what do I do? Where do I go from there? So then we want to take a look at, you know, what your business is, um, you know, what kind of level of activity you expect and, you know, some of those kind of questions, what your other tax situation is. You have a couple of choices if you do go the entity route, right? You can do a, an LLC. And if you're a 100% owner of the LLC, we call it a single member LLC. And the, the federal government says that a single member LLC is a disregarded entity, which means it basically does not exist for tax purposes, for federal tax purposes. So you would still file a Schedule C for your business activity. And when you look at your tax return, it's not going to look any different than it would if you're just a sole proprietor, right? So hmm. having an LLC is pretty simple. Um, it does add that layer of liability protection, but tax-wise, there's not going to be a lot of difference on the income tax side of things. Any income you earn in the LLC would be taxed to you the same way it would if you were a sole proprietor. Um, you earn income as you receive it. You get deductions as you pay things out. The net income you have is going to be taxable income to you. You're going to be paying self-employment tax on the income in either scenario, which is you know your your share of Social Security and Medicare taxes, as well as the employer share. So that can definitely add up. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's going to look a, a lot like the sole proprietorship, but just a little bit of extra uh, layer of liability in between you. And, uh, you know, your customers or vendors or, or whatever, the rest of the world. On the uh, California side, there is going to be a little bit of a difference with the LLC. You're going to have a minimum $800 a year tax for having the LLC. So to do business in our state, 800 bucks minimum, whether you make money, lose money, whatever, 800 a year, guaranteed. Uh, there's also a gross receipts fee on the LLC. So if you exceed certain gross receipts thresholds, you add an additional fee to California. So the first uh, threshold is $250,000 of gross receipts. The second one's a half million. Hmm. The third one's at a million, then two and a half million and five million. And the the fee goes up. It starts at 900 bucks at the 250,000 gross level. And then it goes to like 1,700 at the half million. And I think it's 2,500 at a million and and goes up from there. So that can be a big consideration because if you have a high sales, but like mm-hmm. low gross profit margin business, um, you can get hammered by that LLC fee mm-hmm. and it becomes a big chunk of your net income, right? So maybe LLC is not the right choice for you. Interesting. Um, yeah. 
maybe you're better off with a you know a C corp S corporation or something like that, right? Which okay. we'll talk about next. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the gross receipts fee is definitely a consideration, and and actually another thing which has come up recently for me is you know got a couple clients that are flipping homes, right? So they're buying a house, fixing it up, selling it. So those are high dollar value items, and when you're a a dealer in real estate when the IRS says you're kind of doing it as like a flipping kind of thing and doing several transactions a year. Um, the gross receipts from a sale isn't just your, your net gain. It's actually the gross sales price of the home. So we specifically have avoided the LLC with our real estate flipping clients for that reason. Cause they get hammered on the, on the uh, gross receipts fee. Right. Hmm. And that eats into their profit. Hmm. Okay, so keep going though. So, so there's a couple other aspects of a single member LLC that I think everybody really needs to know. And you, you talk about a pass through entity. What does that mean? Yeah, so an LLC and sole proprietorship are pass through entities, which means all the income earned by the business, all the expenses incurred by the business, they all flow down and are reported on your personal tax return. So it ends up being a part of your personal return. There's no separate um, corporate level of tax or anything on a single member LLC or on a sole proprietorship. And that's actually true of a subchapter S corporation as well. It's commonly referred to as an S corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, so a C corporation, however, where you form a regular corporate entity, that's going to have a separate layer of taxation. It's actually a completely different taxable entity. It's going to file its own tax return. It's going to pay its own net income tax. And then if you withdraw money from that corporation, as a dividend, you're going to pay a second layer of tax on your on your 1040 and your personal taxes. So when you hear, you know, the term double taxation thrown around in regards to corporate income tax, that's that's what that refers to. The corporation pays its own income tax and then personally you pay a second layer of tax when the money comes out of the corporation to you. Right. But that does not happen with an LLC, correct? Correct. You can earn money, you can keep all the cash in the LLC bank account, you're still going to pay the tax on the income that year. When you withdraw the cash from the corporate or the LLC bank account, sorry, uh, you won't pay tax on the withdrawal, right? And that's a, a common confusion, I think, for people when they start going down this path of setting up an entity. A lot of times they think if they leave the money in the business and they don't pay tax on it or when they take it out, they, they pay tax. The, the money going back and forth between the business account and your personal account, that's irrelevant. Those are just transfers, okay? So when the, when the LLC is a pass-through entity and, and part of your personal taxes, your tax on all the activity of that LLC, whether you leave the money in the corporate account or – sorry, I keep saying corporate. You leave it in the LLC account or you bring it out to your personal account, right? Mm -hmm. What about uh, self-employment taxes, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, FICA, all of that stuff with an LLC? Just like a sole proprietorship on that, you're going to pay the full bore, all of all of the self-employment tax and all your income from the LLC. So that's one of the disadvantages of an LLC and a sole proprietorship is you're paying self-employment tax on the entire amount of income. Um, you know, in the, the lower levels of income, that's not really as big of a deal. When I say lower levels, you know, maybe you're making like 100000 or less or maybe up to two hundred. Um, you'd probably be paying all those taxes no matter what type of entity you're in. But if you start getting into the couple hundred thousand or more range of income, you may want to look at an S corporation because, well, an S corporation is also a pass through entity like an LLC or sole proprietorship where the income tax activity is reported on your personal return from the S corporation. That flow through income is actually not subject to the self-employment tax. So you avoid Social Security and Medicare tax on the pass-through portion of income from the S corporation, and uh, you know that's, that's something the IRS is looking out for. Mm -hmm. uh, the way they uh, make sure that's fair is that you have to basically become an employee of your S corporation, and you pay yourself through payroll, mm -hmm. it's like W two, and you end up paying the Social Security and Medicare on those wages, right? But you know, let's say your net income of the business is four hundred thousand dollars before taking into account your salary. If you take a salary of 150000 on W-2, you're going to mm -hmm. pay Social Security up to the max, which is like the wage base is 118000 I think, or it you know, goes up every year. And then the Medicare, you're going to pay on the entire amount of the 150000 of income. Mm -hmm. But on the remaining two fifty of income, you know, the four hundred k net income minus your 150 salary, mm -hmm. on that two fifty k, you'll pay income tax because it's a pass-through entity on the S-Corp. 
but you won't pay the Social Security or Medicare tax. You're basically saving the Medicare tax at that point, which is going to be about 3.8%. So mm. those dollars add up yeah. as the income goes higher. Yeah. Right. Well, let's break down an S-Corp a little bit more. So uh, there, the S-Corp provides you a little bit of a layer of insulation, correct? So so before we really jump into that, when you're meeting with people and sitting down and saying, okay, which one are you going to choose? And, and maybe they are an LLC now. What are the triggers that make Matt say, okay, you need to move to this next level? How, how do you make that decision? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think we'll look at the gross receipts of the business and see if that gross receipts fee on LLC is, is, you know, eating into our profit or making an impact because the S Corp, you know, is not going to have that. Uh, we will look at, um, <clears throat> you know, whether you already have employees or not, because if you have to add payroll for yourself, that's kind of an extra, you know, bit of cost. But if you're already running payroll, then it's not really an additional cost. Um, and then we'll take a look at what the net income of the business is and that self-employment, you know, differential there, because if you, you're paying a lot of the self-employment tax on the LLC, you know, there comes a point where the S corporation is better. And we actually have a calculator where we'll, we'll kind of run a comparison of the two and then see what your annual savings would be on that. And that's something we're going to have on our, our website as well, where you can kind of run through your own little calculation there and, and see, am I getting close to the break even point where I should be? switching to an S corporation or thinking about an S corporation instead of an LLC. From a compliance standpoint, um, now that we're starting to move up the ladder and we're actually a legitimate corporation, what, uh, what do you need to pay attention to there? Because there's a lot of little nuances here that you need to make sure you're covering, correct? Yeah. A corporation or S corporation is going to be a little more formal. Okay. So you're going to have to, you know, you're supposed to do board minutes and meetings and have elected directors and all that kind of stuff. Um, usually when you set up something like that, the attorney you work with, or even if you use like a legal Zoom type service, they're going to have a lot of those basic forms for you to, to use and fill out. But you're starting to add complexity on just the compliance side of things by, by having these different things. So you're starting to add little, little layers of extra work. You're going to have, you know, more legal cost, I think, probably setting up a, a corporation than, a, than an LLC typically. But, you know, it can depend wildly on your agreement and everything and, and how complicated you want to make it. With the S corporation, you're also going to now have a, a separate taxable entity need to file its own tax return. So when we talked about the LLC being disregarded for federal purposes and not existing, the S corp does exist for federal purposes. So it's going to have its own corporate income tax return. We file an 1120S form. So now you've gone from a single return to two returns. So obviously, you know, you're going to have more compliance costs there in two filings. Um, I'm getting a little more complicated. You're probably going to need to have a little bit cleaner books and records because on the S corporation return, we got to put together a full balance sheet and, you know, disclose that to the IRS and show all the book to tax adjustments, some of that kind of stuff that we, we get away with not having to put that on the 1040 on the Schedule C for a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC. So, you know, just all these little things keep adding up, right? You're going to have payroll if you're taking out income. So now you got to use a payroll service or something like that. And you have quarterly payroll tax filings. Um, we just need to take all these things into consideration and make sure that you're ahead after extra costs, right? Mm -hmm. That it, it's a, it's a good decision to make. And, you know, when you have a lot of that income that you can avoid the, the Medicare tax on, or the Social Security and Medicare tax, you know, that can add up and probably, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a break even point, And then there's a point where you get ahead and your compliance costs are less. And sure. Now, do you, you do you guys do uh, payroll services for people? We do do payroll. A lot of times we'll, um, you know, have you use a, a payroll service and we'll kind of help you oversee the, the regular payroll. The, the service is pretty efficient at taking care of the quarterly filings and everything. But um, actually, I'm glad you bring that up because for an S Corp, um, payroll, we need to run payroll, but there's a little bit of special payroll that happens for a, like a greater than 2% shareholder in S corporation. If you, if you have health insurance coverage through your S corporation, you got to add the value of the health insurance coverage paid by the corp to your W2 by the end of the year in order to take the deduction on your personal return, the self-employed health insurance deduction. And we see this like almost every year, like clockwork with new clients or with even existing clients that don't listen to us, <laughs> you know, where they, um, 
they need to go back and amend or fix their W-2 because they forgot to add the health insurance for the yes corp. So there are little funky things like that. Uh, we're certainly on top of that, and we, you know, communicating with our clients. We have an alert that goes out to all of our S corp clients before the end of the year, reminding them to, to get that on there. But that's definitely a common one. Well, you talked about a pass-through entity already, but highlight that one more time. And um, there were a couple of interesting things uh, with the LLC that you had said that there were the gross receipts of, uh, you know, $250,000, so about $900 a year. Now, that that doesn't necessarily apply here to the S-Corp. So let's break down some of the gross receipts and payments and pass-through and taxation. On the S-Corporation? Yep. Yeah, so the gross receipts fee, there's no gross receipts fee for California on the S Corporation, so we don't need to worry about that. But there is going to be a net income tax for the S Corporation on California. That's 1.5% of the net income of the business. So that the net income of your business for the S Corp is going to be the net income of the business after taking into account your salary and everything, right, after your W-2. So whatever that number is. One and a half percent of that, you're going to pay that net income tax, or you're going to pay the $800 tax, whichever one is greater. So, if you lose money for the year, you're going to pay the minimum $800 tax. Once you start getting up to, you know, I think it's like 60 or 70 grand of, of business income, you're going to start to get close to paying the $800, you know, minimum tax, and go from there. So, or over the $800, the one and a half percent. Sorry. So why does so California love that eight hundred dollar number? I mean, it seems that's pretty uh, standard. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just they've decided that's what they're going to add to you know for the privilege of doing business in our our state. And you know, there's a lot of court cases around that. You got to be really wary of it if you are an out of state business or person, but you're doing any sort of activity in California. They'll try and suck you into the system and, <laughs> and get get your eight hundred bucks. There was a court case just happened where. Um, it was appealed, and actually the taxpayer finally won, but there was an out-of-state LLC, and they owned, like, some minute interest in another entity, like point, you know, 0.1% or less that was doing business in California. And California was trying to say that the entity that was the investor that had the point one interest, they owed $800 oh, for doing geez. business in California. It's wow. absolutely ridiculous. Huh. And they lost. The case is called SWART, S-W-A-R-T. But um, – <clears throat> Yeah, so you got to be careful with the 800, and they haven't changed it in a long time. I'm mm. surprised. Probably, you know, there'll be an inflation adjustment coming soon. Yeah, trust trust me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, 800 is a magic number. So okay. you start doing business here, 800 bucks. Gotcha. And that's one of those reasons why, if you, you know, I ask, do you need an entity? If you're a consultant, and you're making a, you know, a couple thousand bucks a year or something. You don't need to set up an LLC because you're already going to start triggering 800 bucks a year. Or I see people, you know, put the cart before the horse, like I said. And they, you know, go out, they get an entity set up, they do all this work, they get a bank account, whatever, and they don't even have any customers yet. One client, I was an engineer, and he, it's funny, he uh, was so focused on the, you know, compliance aspect of getting everything set up and that kind of stuff, but he didn't have any clients yet. And I was <laughs> like, you, you know, you need to worry about your business first, and the, the rest of the stuff will follow, right? If, if you're not going to have any clients, if you're not going to actually end up running a business, you're going to spend a lot of money just to get something set up you're never going to use. So, yeah. you know, that, that $800, you know, once you start, it's hard to stop. you got to go through the whole thing of dissolving your business and mm -hmm. file final returns and the whole, the whole deal. Mm. Well, what happens if there's losses? Uh, that's something that I was always interested in in all three of these entities. But what happens if I'm running my business at a loss? How is that handled with an S-Corp versus uh, the LLC? In S Corp and LLC, you're going to be very similar on the losses. They're all going to flow down to your personal return again because they're pass-through entities. Uh, for a lot of new businesses, you're going to have losses in the beginning as you ramp up. You're going to have, you know, investigation phase and you know, these various startup costs, and you're going to, you know, be slowly acquiring new customers and that kind of thing. And so those losses, we can use those losses if you're active in the business. We can use them to offset your other income. So if this is like a, a second kind of thing you're doing on the side, but you have regular employment income from your main employer, like W-2 income, we can take these startup losses. We can offset that W-2 income, and you can generate some big tax savings for all these business expenses that you're that you're doing right now, right, um, that you're, you're spending up front. Similarly, if you have like a lot of investment income or something, you can use those losses to offset the investment income. Or there's, there's all kinds of planning we can do. That's why you're your personal tax situation and what's going on there 
really does have a bearing on which type of entity you choose in the beginning for some of this stuff. Sure. I see a, a lot of uh, people here in Silicon Valley that the common um, wisdom is to go form a C corporation, a regular C corporation, right? And they want to do that because they want to get venture capital funding and those kind of things. And the VCs prefer C corporations for a couple of reasons. But um, when you do a C corporation, which I guess we'll just start getting into that, yeah. it's not it's not a flow through entity, right? It's not a pass through entity. So any losses in the C corporation, they're trapped inside the C corporation. So if you're gonna if you're gonna bootstrap for a little while, or you know have a couple investors, but you're you're gonna um, you know know you're gonna have a startup loss phase period. Think about doing one of the past entities in the beginning, like an LLC. You can always switch later on, um, and it's pretty easy to switch, like from LLC to a corporate form, like mm -hmm. a C or S corporation. It's actually harder to go the other way and go from a C or S corporation down to an LLC, or not down, but just you know, change to that or go to a sole proprietorship or something. Well, so, Matt, do you, do you have to have a reason though? I mean, do you have to? explain why you're moving between the different corporate structures? Obviously, as you were just saying, moving up through the corporate structures as we're talking about today with Choice of Entity. But, I mean, do you have to elaborate? Do you have to say, well, I'm going to be an S-Corp because of this or a C-Corp because of this? I mean, you don't need to tell the IRS why, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you just got to follow the rules, you okay. know, and check the boxes and fill out the forms. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And so a strategy, you know, that we take here at Wheeler CPA is... You know, we have we have um, wealthier clients sometimes that are kind of have their hands in a couple different you know new startups and that kind of thing, and uh, you know we try to encourage them to go the pass through route in the beginning, really help offset a lot of your losses or a lot of your income with those pass through losses, and then if one of those startup entities starts to turn profitable or you're going to go try and get venture funding or something, well then you just you know snap you flip to a C corp at that point mm -hmm. in time. And uh, now if there's income in the C-Corp, it pays its own corporate tax, but there can be you know, advantages to having it shielded from you. Okay. That's actually one of the main reasons why the VC people want a C-Corp because they, they do a lot of investments, right? And, I mean, you can imagine how complicated their taxes would be if they had to report all the flow-through income of all these little investments they did. Eesh. So, Yeah, yeah goodness that, gracious. So the C-Corp is a nice shield. I mean, every, you know, every public company is a C-Corp, obviously – almost all of them except for the, the publicly traded partnerships, the master limited partnerships. But, um, <clears throat> you know, they do that because you can imagine if everybody that owned a share of Coca-Cola had to report their share of Coca-Cola's income every year and, you know, all the different stocks you own, that'd be a nightmare, right? So the C corporation is a shield where it kind of separates you from the activity of the business. And that's why the venture capital guys and such will, will want that type of structure. There's also legal reasons as well. They have more, more kind of control there. but Now, we've talked about double taxation, but before we get to that, it, this the C-Corp is set up from a compliance standpoint and a legal pers uh, standpoint a lot like the S-Corp, right? So there are a lot of costs that are there with compliance and reporting. Am I right there or am I off? Yeah, you're exactly right. The S is actually, the S-Corp is actually just the a subset of the regular corporation. It is a regular corporation, only you've made an election to be treated as a subchapter S corporation. So you've done a, an extra step okay. to turn your regular corporation into a pass-through entity. But if you don't do that, then otherwise they're very similar. The only d major difference is that the uh, you know taxation is separate in the C corporation. It's going to pay its own income tax, and it's going to be a little you know different than the flow-through nature of the S corporation. Okay. Okay. Double taxation. Double taxation. Yeah. So C corporation earns money. It's going to pay tax at the corporate tax rate. There's a lot of talk now about corporate tax reform that we have really high corporate rates. We'll compare to the rest of the world, you know, uh, we'll see where that goes. But the, the idea is we really have double taxation. So going back to the example of Coca-Cola that you own in your portfolio or something, Coca-Cola pays its own income taxes, right? prints money. They make a lot of money. They mm -hmm. pay a lot of income tax. When they issue dividends to you, which they do, you also pay tax on those dividends. That is double taxation. You're actually being taxed twice, right? Hmm. Coca-Cola has earned money and paid its own share of federal taxes of the government, and now the government wants another slice when you get a dividend from Coca-Cola. Hmm. That same exact treatment when you have your own corporation that you own 100%. It's still a regular corporation. 
your corporation is going to pay income tax, and if you take a dividend, you're going to pay a second layer of tax. Now, a dividend is not the only way to get money out of a corporation, right? So that's just the way where you're going to have double taxation. Usually, with our clients, we will try and zero out the corporate income for the year, if possible, by taking salary or bonus to the owner or owners and uh, get the income to them that way. When you take W-2 income out of your corporation because you're an employee, then the corporation is going to get a deduction for the wages paid. So you're going to lower the income by the amount of wages paid. On the other side, you're going to have W-2 income on your personal return, but now it's basically just a single layer of taxation because the corporation is not paying any income tax. It's able to wipe all its income away by paying wages, and now you just pay a single layer. The problem is that the you know W-2 income is taxed at ordinary income rates, and dividend income has a little bit more preferential tax treatment. It's kind of like the long-term capital gains and everything. So mm-hmm. there's, there's things to consider there, but... Generally speaking, that's one of the ways you can kind of get out of the double taxation hmm. is, is by paying wages. Well, another way for them to get rid of or, or, or just understand all of this is to sit down and talk to you. So who at your firm specializes in doing this and uh, how long should somebody um, block out to sit down and talk to somebody like you to see what choice of entity they should make? You know, we have several tax managers and partners who are all familiar with these, you know, basic choice of entity concepts that you could really sit with. So you want to talk with someone on our tax team for sure, someone that specializes on the business side. Um, we have those people listed on our website, you know, under our, our people section. And uh, you're probably going to want to block out like, you know, an hour, I would say. You know, it, it could be longer. But, you know, I, I figure on an hour to kind of go through a lot of these questions. We'll ask you questions. We'll get answers. We'll kind of build an assessment of where you are. We'll use the calculator to see if LLC is better than S corporation or vice versa or whether a C corporation matters. Um, you know, if, if it's a little bit of a bigger business or something, we'll probably be involving the attorney in this discussion because there's a lot of legal, you know, ramifications behind each type of entity as well, which – it's not even really something we're covering here today, obviously, but it plays a huge role. So you're going to want a team, you know, of people generally, attorney, yourself, CPA, and, and you're going to help decide what's the right type of entity. But you know, I plan at least an hour for the initial discussion just to kind of explore all the rabbit holes. Okay. Well, and I appreciate that. I think uh, our listeners will appreciate that too, because what you went through is is really a mouthful of really great questions and can have such long-term ramifications on your business. So sitting down and just spending an hour with somebody to pick their brain and have them actually pick yours can really make a, a huge difference. So any closing thoughts, words of wisdom for our listeners on Choice of Entity today? Uh, you know, don't put the cart before the horse. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, a lot of people that just have a a simple little side business going, keep it simple because once you go down this road, you're going to increase your cost. But if you are going to go these costs or go these route with the extra entities and everything, then you need to, you know, commit and you got to really sit down and talk with us and decide which one's best. And, you know, try not to be cheap. Basically, when you do go down the route, you're going to have to, you know, pick the entity. It's going to best serve you and you know, be the best financial decision for you overall, considering legal tax and practical considerations. I have had an enormous amount of sense of relief after my CPA asked me these questions. Uh, and, and where I live, we don't have that $800 thing that keeps coming up. But we uh, <laughs> we do have a self-employment tax, which is quite interesting. But the overall idea here is the conversation has to happen. Uh, if you're going to start a business, if you're in a business and you really are hoping to grow or, or even protect yourself or protect your family or anything along those lines, really sit down with everybody at Wheeler CPAs because that's going to make a big difference and can really change everything long term for where your business is going and what you're going to be doing from a tax perspective. Is that right? That's right. All right, man. Well, thank you very much. So just so everybody knows, we're going to continue with the choice of entity discussion on our next podcast, but we're going to be talking about multiple owners. So today we talked about the single owner aspect, uh, the four different types of the sole owner uh, business choice of entity. And next time we're going to be talking about what it means to be uh, having multiple people involved, which as you all know, the more people you get involved, the more complex things can get. So Matt, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Matt. All right. And everybody have a great day. This This is Matt Halloran for Matt Wheeler. We'll talk to you soon.